Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us at the Missouri History Museum tonight for our Perspectives on Science and History series, which is presented in partnership with the Academy of Science of St. Louis. Before we begin, I do want to ask you to please turn off your cell phones or any other devices you might have that could uh, disrupt the program. And I do have quite a few comments to share with you before we begin in earnest, so please bear with me for just a minute here. Uh, the museum is very pleased to continue partnering with the Academy of Science on this series. Many of you uh, may be Academy members and friends, but for those of you who are not familiar with the Academy of Science, I'm going to take just a few moments to tell you a bit about who they are. The Academy is an independent science organization supported entirely through community contributions. They have been connecting science and the community since 1865 and have a long-standing mission to advance the public understanding of science and to inspire the next generation of scientists and science advocates. They continue celebrating more than 150 years of community service by offering a broad range of free and low-cost public science programming, collaborative seminar series, and trips and tours highlighting science at venues throughout the region. You can find more about uh, the Academy and their community-wide events at uh, their website, which is www.academyofsciencestl.org. You can also visit them on Facebook or Twitter, and they also have some literature outside um, on the table just outside the auditorium. So if you're interested in helping to support the Academy's many science opportunities for children and adults uh, throughout the metro region, there are also some membership brochures which you can also find out on the table. If you'd like to receive e-notifications of upcoming Academy uh, and Missouri History Museum events, there are also some e-news sign-up sheets um, that are available for you to put, uh, sign up for e-notifications. And I do want to mention a few of the upcoming Academy of Science events that you might have an interest in attending. So first, coming up tomorrow night, you can join in an evening of art, food, and science from 7 to 8.30 at the Webster House Galleries in Webster Groves. Registered dietitians Lauren Landfried and Dan Brewer, who are both with St. Louis University's Department of Nutrition Dietetics, create a healthy meal using the dietitian's three favorite words, balance, variety, and moderation, in exploring food through textures and a tasting is included in that event. You do need to register to attend. You can do so by logging onto their website, which is academyofsciencestl.org, or by calling 314-533-8586. There are limited spaces, and of course, it's tomorrow night, so register soon. The event is being presented in conjunction with the Webster House Gallery's exhibition, A Feast for the Eyes, a food-inspired art exhibition, which is on display through Thursday, July 19th. Then next up on Tuesday, July 9th from 10 a.m. to noon at the Dennis and Judith Jones Visitors Center, which is right here in Forest Park, St. Louis University Cancer Center music therapist Crystal Weaver will talk about music therapy and its role in stress reduction in hitting the high notes. This event also requires registration. Once again, you can do that at academyofsciencestl.org or by calling 533-8586. On Tuesday and Wednesday, July 23rd and 24th from 8.30 to 4 p.m., in partnership with the Missouri Botanical Garden, the Academy presents Foodology for Schools, Let's Grow, which is a two-day summit for educators, district leaders, school food service professionals, parents and students, and pretty much anyone who's interested in knowing more about healthier, fresher, and more locally grown fruits and vegetables um, going into our school gardens, cafeterias, classrooms, and family kitchens. The cost is $50, that covers both days, and you're welcome to attend as an individual, but you do need to register as a team, and a team can consist of up to five people. If you're interested, once again, you can go back to academyofsciencestl.org, where you can get more information and register. Um, also on July 24th, from 1.30 to 3 p.m., if you missed him when he was here at the museum in December, Dr. Kurt Studd speaks at the center of Clayton on brushing up on history, dentistry through the ages. I can assure you that's a fascinating talk, so if you have a chance to get to it, I encourage you to do that. Registration is once again required, and once again, you can do that through the Academy website. And finally, uh, be sure to mark your calendars for the next Perspectives on Science and History lecture series, which is back here in the Lee Auditorium on Tuesday, August 20th at 7 p.m., Washington University Professor of Psychiatry, Dr. Rumi Cato Price, will talk about the science of war injuries from Vietnam to Afghanistan in When Soldiers Come Home, and no registration is required for that one. It's free and open to the public. 
You can find more science opportunities, talks, and tours on the Academy website or listed on the event flyers and Academy literature that's on the table just outside the auditorium. And to see the current lineup of museum events, you can also pick up one of our calendar of events, which is also located on the table outside the auditorium. We have programs almost every day, including programs like tonight's, which brings together two exhibits that we have currently on display. The first exhibit is Gridiron Glory, which comes to us from the Pro Football Hall of Fame and is the most comprehensive traveling exhibit ever created about professional football, including 200 artifacts, photos, and documents. That exhibit will be up through September 3rd, and while it is a ticketed exhibit, it's free to residents of St. Louis City and County on Tuesdays, and it is also free to active duty military personnel and their immediate families every day. The second exhibit is Between Two Worlds, Veterans Journey Home, which is unusual in the fact that it, was, it is our first ever exhibit created by our Teens Make History exhibitors team, which is a group of local high schoolers who work for the museum and who worked with our exhibitions and collections department to put together this exhibit that explores the struggles of 20th century soldiers to stay connected to home while they're away and then again to eventually transition back into home life. For this exhibit, the students conducted all of the oral history interviews themselves, and uh, personally, I think they did a really fantastic job, so I encourage you to see that. Um, that'll be on display through October 20th and is free every day. So those two exhibits are going to come together in tonight's talk, and we are very pleased to have with us Dr. David Brody to deliver this program. Dr. David Brody earned his undergraduate degree in biological sciences from Stanford University, and both his MD and PhD from Johns Hopkins University as part of the National Institutes of Health Medical Scientists training program. He completed his internship in internal medicine and his neurology residency at Barnes Jewish Hospital in St. Louis. And in 2004, he received the Leonard Berg Prize for research conducted during residency and the Medical Student Teaching Award at Washington University. He is a board certified neurologist and is currently an associate professor of neurology in the Department of Neurology at Washington University School of Medicine, where he is also the site director for the National Football League Player Care Program. Dr. Brody treats patients with subacute and chronic sequelae of traumatic brain injury in the Center for Advanced Medicine's Traumatic Brain Injury Clinic. Dr. Brody's research focuses on the development of novel therapeutic and diagnostic strategies for traumatic brain injury a major cause of morbidity and mortality worldwide, a major risk factor for the development of Alzheimer's disease, and the single leading cause of permanent disability in people under age 45 in the US. He is here with us tonight to talk about football concussions and battlefield brain injuries, what we think we know and what we don't know about long-term impact. So please, on behalf of the Missouri History Museum and the Academy of Science, join me in welcoming Dr. David Brody. It's uh, I'm honored to be here. It's nice to, uh, it's actually my first time I've ever set foot in this building, so that's kind of cool. Um, so what I was asked to uh, talk about is something that I've spent a lot of my time thinking about, which is uh, concussions in soldiers, US military personnel on the battlefield, and uh, in sports, in, in athletes, football players, and, and other sorts of contact sport athletes. Can you all hear me OK if I step away from the microphone? It's, we're OK? OK, um, So I'm not sure exactly what your areas of interest are and what your level of knowledge on this topic is. So I'm going to try to be fairly general, but what I really would like, what would be great, is if you guys stop me anytime during the presentation, ask a question, ask questions, okay? That would be great. I don't want to just stand here and show my slides. That's not that fun for me. Um, it's much more interesting for me and more informative for, for you all if you stop and ask questions anytime, okay? Is that, is that okay? All right. Uh, Good. So the stuff I'm going to talk about today is um, not just my work. I've got a really great team. My, my lab group, um, Christine McDonald has been the project leader on a lot of the projects that, that I'm going to talk to you guys about today. Um, Colonel Flaherty and Lieutenant Colonel Fang and my military collaborators, military medicine collaborators. These are the, the trauma surgeons from, uh, from, from the U.S. military who have done a lot of the work that we're going to talk about. And um, as part of our project, I had an opportunity to travel to Afghanistan in 2011. This is me hanging out right in front of uh, Osama bin Laden's old headquarters right there. Um, so, you know, it's been a very interesting process. 
this is the, really the whole list of all the people that are involved. It's really a, a, a large team that goes into this sort of project. And our work has been funded by the U.S. Department of Defense. And most recently by the National Football League also. So my usual disclosures, I don't have any conflicts of interest, financial or otherwise. Okay, we get started. So first of all, just get everybody on the same page. What is a traumatic brain injury? It's an injury to the brain structure due to an acute external physical force that results in impaired brain function. So usually this is car accidents, or falls, <coughs> or assaults. There's a lot of interest in blast injuries due to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and these range from relatively mild injuries, like with, rel with transient loss of consciousness or confusion, which is what we call concussion, to uh, devastating or fatal injuries. And uh, as was mentioned in the, um, in the introduction, it is the most common cause of permanent disability in people under age 45. Um, and the, the results of repeated injuries can be cumulative. There's been a lot of interest in this in boxers and football players and military personnel who have multiple concussions that don't necessarily recover from the first one before they may have, uh, fully before they have another one. And uh, this has been in the news a lot about National Football League player suicides as a result of um, mood problems after multiple concussions. And I've seen some of these retired players with serious problems in, in clinic. And it's a, it's a very real and important problem. So since we're in the History Museum, I, I thought I would put a, a bit of a historical note. Um, traumatic brain injuries are about the earliest described illnesses in human experience. This is, um, there was a, a South African australopithecine specimen of our human ancestors with about a three million year old skull with distinct cranial fractures that appear to be caused by assault with an antelope humerus, a bone. So this is not new. Our human, our previous ancestors were doing the same thing, causing traumatic brain injuries to each other. And it's probably not going to go away anytime soon, I'm afraid. The world's oldest medical document is this called the Edwin Smith Surgical Papyrus from 26th century BCE in Egypt. And it provided a written description of the effects of traumatic brain injury in wartime, contralateral opposite side motor pro uh, movement problems and impaired consciousness after uh, head injuries. So yeah, there it is. You guys can read that, right? Okay, me neither. Um, but I'll take their word for it, the people who translated this. So more recently, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan have focused our attention on traumatic brain injury because this has really been the signature war, the signature injury of these wars. Um, improvised explosive devices, um, body armor has prevented fatalities, so people are returning home with traumatic brain injury, whereas in previous wars they may have died because of the body armor. Um, so there's a lot of survivors of these, which is good that they survive, but there's a lot of issues that arise when they survive these sorts of things. So the question of whether blast-related injuries have unique features compared with other types of injuries, such as falls and motor vehicle accidents and sports-related injury, that was sort of a new science, because now all of a sudden people are surviving these blast-related injuries and they're coming home with new sorts of neurological and psychiatric problems. And so we as scientists were going to try to take on this new problem to try to understand this relatively new disease. It's not completely a new disease, but it's much more, we're getting a lot more attention on it focused from the wars. So, of course, as soon as there were explosions, there were brain injuries related to them. Um, there was explosions after uh, dynamite was invented in 1866. Um, there was a gunpowder disaster in 1885 that got a lot of attention. But back then, the primary focus was on lung injury, not on brain injury, because if you had a big blast exposure, you might die from the lung injuries immediately, and if you died, then the brain injury didn't really matter, did it? Um, but there was, um, it was actually the severe injuries that were resulting from the explosions were part of the motivation for Alfred Nobel, who invented dynamite, to fund the series of prizes, of Nobel Prizes, because he was very concerned about the harm that his invention had done to the world because of these blast-related injuries. Um, and hoped he could mitigate that somewhat with his money. So um, there was this term in World War I called shell shock. There was, when people were exposed to mortar shells, there were a lot of ideas about what happened to the brain during these uh, injuries. And the symptoms were loss of consciousness and tremors and depression and irritability and fatigue and reduced intellectual capacity. So very similar to the sorts of things we deal with with um, traumatic brain injury recently. Um, but there was very little science back then in the World War I era. There were only two 
pathological studies of the brain, and they showed congestion of the blood vessels and uh, neuronal chromatolysis, which is a technical term for swelling up of the, uh, some of the nerve cells in the brain. But they didn't have a lot of the modern scientific techniques that we have now, so they really couldn't tell what was going on, to be honest. Um, there was some bleeding, and one idea was that carbon monoxide gas was responsible. And another was that these were primary psychiatric symptoms, that they were the shock and fear and anxiety from the, Ill, from the situation, but not actually damage to the structure of the brain responsible for the symptoms. And um, this issue was never resolved. The war came to an end, and they never solved this problem. They sort of hoped it would go away and not come back, but it didn't. The World War II era, there was the same question of whether it's organic, meaning structure damage to, structural damage to the brain, versus psychogenic, meaning a psychological reaction. And uh, the typical symptoms were the same, headaches and dizziness, intolerance to noise, irritability, vertigo, um, tinnitus, I mean, ringing in the ears, and fatigue. They had a little more technology, they had skull x-rays and Newman cephalograms, which was a thing where they injected air into the spinal fluid and the spinal cord and it would rise up into the head and they could take x-rays of the contrast between the air and the brain. Um, gave the, the, the people who had it terrible headaches, but it did allow us to look at the, the, the brain a little bit. Um, they had this great new technology called EEG, an electroencephalogram back then. And um, it was very nonspecific. They showed a few things, but it never really showed what was wrong. But also, the science of psychiatry had advanced at that time, and the psychiatric examination was generally unremarkable also. So the question was, was it organic and psychogenic? They didn't have any evidence for either. So they couldn't figure it out. The issue was unresolved after World War II. And again, they hoped it would go away. Um, but it didn't. And the reason I say this, to keep emphasizing this, the fact that we hope it would go, they hoped it would go away and it didn't, is because we're hoping now, as these wars in Iraq and Afghanistan are coming to an end, that it's going to go away. And the chances of that are pretty small. It's not going to go away. It, it never has, and so I don't think it ever will. Um, so in these wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, there's been about 400-something cases of severe traumatic brain injury. You know, people were in intensive care unit and all that. Um, blast was most common, but the mortality is amazingly low. We're doing a fantastic job at helping these people survive. This is, in previous era, 50% of these people would have died. Now it's 4.4%. So we've actually come a long way in terms of improving survival. 90% um, in the World War I era. Um, but a lot, and a lot of them actually had pretty good outcomes. I'm not going to get into the technical part of this, but, but a lot of them actually did remarkably well. And we're still, some of these people were still rehabilitating 10 years later. The rehabilitation progress goes on and on. It does not ever come to an end. Let's see. What happened here? There we go. So in contrast to that 400-something group of severe traumatic brain injury cases where people did survive and relatively well, there's really a vast number of the concussive brain injuries from these wars. 1.64 million troops deployed, 19% reported probable TBI, estimated 320,000 with concussive traumatic brain injuries. Um, and a lot of them had not actually seen a physician for this. The, um, there's, there was a lot, there's been a lot of post-traumatic stress symptoms and depression-related symptoms. And um, the claim was, in one paper in 2008 that was, that was very influential, that a lot of the problems that occurred after this illness, like headaches and chest pain, fatigue and sleep disturbances and memory problems, balance problems, ringing in the ears, concentration problems, irritability, etc., were common in people that had these brain injuries. But then, after they statistically adjusted for the effects of post-traumatic stress disorder, that really only headache was the one that was really truly associated with traumatic brain injury. That was a claim based on statistics uh, and an, adjust an adjusted um, test and published in the New England Journal of Medicine. But not really good scientific evidence. So this got a lot of attention, but was not 
really solid from the scientific perspective. So this is about when my team started getting really interested in this topic, was in 2008 when people were making high profile claims that were supported just by statistical arguments, not by actual direct investigations of the brain. So um, the implications of that finding from Dr. Hogue et al. and company were that post-traumatic stress disorder might be the driver of symptoms and that had important therapeutic implications is the treatment would be quite different for the treatment of traumatic brain injury. And, um, but it was a problem because the military had a discrimination of psychiatric versus, quote, organic findings. They often did not give disability or did not give honorable discharge for psychiatric conditions where they did for traumatic brain injury. So there was a strong pushback against this from various members of the military that, no, this is maybe not the case. There's also a substantial stigma associated with psychiatric disorders. And there were, um, there's still this question about whether the blast injury caused a physical damage to the brain, which was responsible for part of the problems. So the limitations, of course, the structural aspects of, not, of the injury were not determined. Those were just based on surveys. There was no actual investigation of the structure of the brain. This was self-reported symptoms, not clinically assessed outcomes. And there was no objective measures of cognitive performance. So this is sort of setting the stage for when we came in, what the state of the field was like. You know, this has been a problem that has not been solved since the invention of dynamite. And World War I, World War II, the, the nature, and believe me, we haven't solved it. <laughs> They're not gonna tell you the answer tonight because we don't know. But um, we're just show you some of the progress, the sort of the work in progress of where we're going on this, on this topic. So there was a lot of potentially unique features of blast-related injuries, including vasospasm, spasm of the blood vessels, which doesn't happen typically on a normal, normal brain injury, severe swelling, co-infection with unusual organisms, high incidence of, as we mentioned, and many open questions remained. So a little bit about the physics of blast um, injuries, or blast waves in general. After a blast, there's a very high pressure initially, and then it falls off quickly. And then there's an under pressure, a low pressure below atmospheric that comes afterwards, this negative phase right here. And this is what it looks like sort of in an idealized case. And in a more complex case, what this is is kind of a mock-up of a building. You can see these more complex blast waves as they move through uh, different parts of the, of the building. So this is the, the physics of what's, of what's, uh, what's hitting the person. Um, I'm going to come back to that in a second. Um, and stop here and see what, what questions you guys have. Because now I'm setting the stage in the background, and we're going to start getting into a little bit of more of what my group has been doing. Yeah, please. First thing I noticed was when you were presenting early data, the World War II they would have Iraq as a Um, they did. There was actually quite a bit of data gathered during the Vietnam era, but it wasn't specifically, there wasn't much gathered on blast-related injuries. There, now, if I was going to give a talk on penetrating brain injuries, the Vietnam era was, and the World War II era, was a gold mine. There was tremendous knowledge learned during the Vietnam War era about the effects of penetrating brain injuries. And one of the really cool findings from the Vietnam era was that if bullet wounds penetrated a part of the brain called the amygdala, which is sort of in the sides and the front, um, part of the, along, up next to the ears, the soldiers had absolutely no fear, no post-traumatic stress, no anxiety whatsoever. It destroyed their ability to form fearful memories. And so they had lots of other problems, but post-traumatic stress and anxiety was not one of them. So it told us that there is a specific circuitry neural circuitry that involves that sort of anxiety. I mean, everything that we do, all of our personalities, all of our thoughts and our memories and our emotions are driven by the circuitry and the chemistry of our brains. And so this was telling us what part of the brain was responsible for that particular function. So that was absolutely fascinating. But no, they didn't do a great job collecting information about blast injuries during Vietnam, or Korea for that matter, or during the first Gulf War. Yeah, please. That was my, that was what I did. And that, that's exactly what, that was my role, was to step in and do the, some of the very first imaging studies 
of uh, blast-related injuries. <coughs> they were not done in the previous wars because we didn't have the technology. Please. Could you speak briefly about the impact of damage uh, on the lungs and oxygen intake and how that may affect the damage spread? Oh, absolutely. So one of the things that happens in severe injuries of all types, both blast injuries and um, car accidents and falls and assaults and other kinds of polytrauma, is that shortly after the injury, if the lungs are damaged or the heart circulatory system is damaged and, so, and doesn't get enough oxygen, that causes a secondary wave of injury. So there's this primary injury that's caused by the physical force of the injury itself, and then a secondary injury which can be caused by things like low oxygen. And it turns out to be a one plus one makes four kind of a scenario where it's a negative synergy that the two of them together are worse than the sum of the two parts combined. So it's, it's actually, I mean, one of the most important things that first responders do uh, in the setting of brain injury is make sure the patient's getting enough oxygen and enough blood pressure. Because that's, that's a, you, to avoid that, that one plus one makes four negative synergy type of scenario. And so the, that's part of the reason that the body armor's been so important, because the body armor's done a fantastic job of protecting the lungs from, from blast, from blast over pressure. <coughs> Years ago, I was a manager in the Israel Air Force, and the force I took, I don't know if much has changed since then. One of the things they talked about was that in concussion glass, uh, I think there's a there's possibility of bubbles actually forming in the bloodstream. The same thing for a way to glass that occurs when you're actually in the water or to an air blast. And I was curious to what extent those actually the bubbles um, the interference with blood flow uh, as opposed to just uh, oxygen, oxygen absorption. Yeah, so it's a great question, this notion of air embolism, of air bubbles forming. Um, that's been most carefully studied, just as you say, in the setting of water blasts. So the Navy's done a lot of research on this question in, um, in the submarine warfare department. There hasn't been, we looked for it very carefully, um, not, my, not me personally, but others looked for it very carefully in animal models of air blasts and also in um, our, our military personnel coming back from the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And the empirical finding was it's not that common in air blasts. It may be a substantial issue in water blasts, but that's not been in air blasts. Um, yeah, it was one of the open questions that sort of was put to rest, maybe, partially. But I don't know, maybe the Israelis have some different data, but that's what we have. Please. Uh, I have a question about that guy. Yeah. How do you know if he had a brain damage? How do we know he had a brain damage? Um, he had a skull fracture. The skull was broken. And the sort of fracture that he had um, is the type that, if it were to happen to a human today, would have resulted in bleeding in the brain. Because that sort of skull fracture also cuts the blood vessels. And those blood vessels then bleed into the brain, and that brain bleeds. So of course, we don't know absolutely that he had a brain injury. But it would be highly likely, it would be very difficult to produce that sort of skull fracture without damaging the brain. So, of course, we can't know that perfectly. And he survived. We could see the bone healed. It was not an immediately fatal injury. You could see there was, heal in that, there was healing of that bone, new bone growth, but not for very long, maybe a few days to weeks of new bone growth after that, before the, the person, the, uh, the Australopithecine. Um, stopped forming new bone and presumably died. So um, why would somebody like that have died? Almost certainly from infection. If you have an open skull fracture like that, the brain gets infected and it's almost universally fatal without antibiotics and surgical care. So that's most likely what we think happened. And that's exactly what unfortunately still happens in third world countries that don't have good modern medical practice. This open skull fractures still have a very high fatality rate. No, please. Yeah, is the sheer complexity of the brain and our lack of a complete understanding of how that brain works a major obstacle to understanding the dynamics and the mechanics of how these injuries occur? And, and I have a second question I'd like to address. That's an easy one. Yes. Go ahead. <laughs> and the second question I have is, is there really a complete distinction between psychological injury caused by glass and a physical injury? And if so, how do we know that? Yes. Um, that's actually
question, is the brain's complexity a daunting problem? Yes, it absolutely is. We cannot build good computer models of the mechanics of the brain because it's too complex. We can build models of space ships going up to the moon and back, but the brain is so much more complicated than that that um, we, we can't do. We cannot build that accurate models. There are many parts of the brain whose function we do not know. And so when the particular parts of the brain are damaged, we can't predict what the outcome is going to be because we just don't know what the normal function of these parts of the brain are. Um, that being said, every decade we know about twice as much as we did the decade before, so we're, we're, we're moving along. Um, the question of the, the, more, the more profound question about the distinction between organic injury and a psychological reaction is really one of the profound um, philosophical questions of our era. Because fundamentally, there is no difference. It's all chemistry. It's all based on the structure of the brain. Every psychological reaction has to be embedded in the structure of the brain, the chemistry of exactly how brain cells are talking to each other, because there's nothing else in there. That's the only thing it could be, unless you're a dualist, which I'm not. Um, and, but, and so every generation of scientists moves those two fields closer together. There's still a gap, there's still lots of aspects of the function of the mind that we can't explain yet, but every generation gets better than the one before. So I'll give you some examples. A really, really common cause of, quote, psychiatric illness, um, madness, insanity, whatever you want to call it, um, turned out to be thyroid hormone deficiency. It's an example of something that was absolutely psychiatric, no question about it. But it was thyroid hormone deficiency, they just didn't know about that. Another one was people who had terrible pains in their stomach, clearly caused by stress and poor parenting and all that. It turned out to be a bacteria, Helicobacter pylori. So, you know, every generation we take things that used to be psychiatric and chop them away and find a physical explanation for them and, and narrow them down. So, I don't see any sign that that process is stopping. We extrapolate, we'll just, yeah, we'll just, we'll, 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 we'll get along. Uh, please, yes. Oh yeah, wow, what a great question. The 9-11 victim, so the Boston stuff, nothing's been reported about the Boston brain injury. Some of my colleagues are working on that right now and I'm not really at liberty to say because it's their data to present. But 9-11 bombings, yes, many of them had brain injuries. Many of them also had lung injuries. And many of them had the one plus one makes four combination of brain injuries and lung injuries. And um, there's been a very good group that's been studying the, um, the resiliency of many of them, trying to understand why it was that some people seemed to be so devastated, and yet others recovered so remarkably well. Why, why when many people are confronted with the same horrific event, do some people recover nicely and some people don't recover quite so well? How much of it is due to structural injury to the brain that we can detect? How much of it is due to genetic resiliency factors? I have a little bit of data on that. But um, yeah, the, my colleagues at, uh, at Mount Sinai School of Medicine have been working extensively on that. I'd be happy to give you some references after if you like. That's not my personal, I haven't personally worked with those folks. Please. Um, I just had a follow up question on the philosophical consideration. Mm, yes. Um, uh, if we talk about like, the brain. Does the idea that the subjective can change um, structural, um, can change the structure of the object is found that questionable? Um, so, you know, one of, this is called the hard problem of consciousness. And the reason it's called the hard problem of consciousness is because it's a hard problem. Um, so, what is the subjective experience of consciousness? Where does that arise? And that probably will be the last in the series of the extrapolation of discoveries uh, about, the, about the brain, would be my guess. But um, what we do know, for example, is that volitional action, for example, <coughs> studying hard or practicing a particular skill, which presumably we do by choice, whatever that means, choice, um, changes the structure of the brain. The most widely noted example is uh, violinists, professional musicians who practice the heck out of their violin. They expand the part of the brain that's responsible for sensation in 
and that part of the brain grows, actually physically grows. You can see the growth on the scanners, on the scanner. In fact, sometimes it grows so much that it encroaches on other areas and causes problems. They get dystonias where their body, their hands will twist into unusual positions because the brain has grown too far. It's sort of like overgrown. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so that's an example, a concrete example of what you're talking about. Yes, that exactly that, that happens. But where the choice, the volition, the mind comes from, that's the hard problem. That's, I think, was there another question? I, I, I don't want to miss anybody. Okay. Wow, good discussion so far. I like it. Okay. So now a little bit of scientific background. Um, there's many parts of the brain, and we could study lots of different things. But I'm going to focus on axons. Axons are the wiring of the brain. You can think of the brain as a bunch of cells which fire electrical, sti electrical stimuli, electrical pulses called action potentials. And they send them along wires to other cells. That's how different parts of the brain talk to each other, through these electrical signals going along wires. The wires are called axons. They're between one, they're about one micron, so one one thousandth of a millimeter in diameter, so one twenty-five thousandth of an inch in diameter. You put twenty-five thousand of them in an inch, they're very fine wires, finer than any electrical wires we use. Um, but they're delicate. The wire, the axons are delicate. And after traumatic brain injury, the axons are the most vulnerable to damage. So in a series of autopsy studies, axon injury was universal. Everybody who had injuries. These six people had concussions. These six people had more severe injuries. But every single one of them had axon injury. The other features were variable. Some people had them, some people didn't. But axon injury was, was, was pretty much universal after traumatic brain injury, because that's the most mechanically delicate part of the brain. This is what some of those injured axons look like. Normally, you shouldn't be able to see them. But when they're injured, they accumulate a protein called amyloid precursor protein. And there it is, you can see it staining here. This axon is swollen up to about 10 times its normal size and, and it's filled with junk, filled with uh, this protein that shouldn't be there because it's not working properly. Um, we've studied injured axons in humans as well. This is a, one of our soldiers who unfortunately died about a year after his blast-related traumatic brain injury. And he had injured axons in his brain too. And he had cells, uh, inflammatory cells too. So not only did he have injured axons, he had inflammatory cells. And one of the things I'm gonna tell you is that a new type of scanning method is really good at detecting these injured axons. And this method is called DTI, diffusion tensor imaging. And so I'm gonna give you a lot of, of talk about diffusion tensor imaging because this is our window, our new technology, our window into looking at injured axons, which as I said, are the vulnerable part of the brain after concussion and other sorts of traumatic range. So I don't really have time to go through in great detail, but you're going to have to take my word for it that this should be, oh, wait a minute. I actually have a, um, yeah, here's a control subject. This is a, this is a young man who died from cardiac malformation. No problems with his brain at all. And died quickly and went to autopsy quickly, so did not have a lot of postmortem degeneration. No problem with injured axons at all. Here's what the diffusion tensor imaging normally looks like. So you know, just to give you some background, here's what we did. Here's a slab of his brain. Here's a chunk of his brain taken out of that slab. And this is this low orbital frontal region just above the eyes here. And then we put that in the scanner and we scanned it. And you see it's very bright white. It's got a lot of nice bright white signal here. And that's normal. Normal axons have this very bright white signal on this special type of scan. And here you see it's much less bright white. All these areas where it's not as bright as in the previous slide are all abnormal. That's all signs of injured axons. So there's a lot of injured axons in this blast-related brain. And this radiological, pathological, direct correlation demonstrates that this method of scanning is sensitive. Um, but in contrast, for example, some of these other methods of scanning are not sensitive. So the, the sort of scan that you could get if you walked into an emergency room or you, you came to my office and I ordered it um, clinically, those sorts of scans that we can all get now are not sensitive to injured axons. So we're not very good at doing this now, but hopefully we will in the future when we start using this in clinical practice. Right now this is just for research. It's not available for clinical care. Please. Well, last wave, 
this I understand, is not necessarily fractured skulls, fractured penetrating. That's the wave itself, the concussive wave. That's right. right? All so these this, people. This skull wasn't penetrated by shrapnel or bullet or anything. This was strictly sound Correct. and wave. Correct. So, right? It's a supersonic pressure wave. Faster than the speed of sound. And, um, and uh, yeah, it's, that's right. So there's no skull fracture here. And the brain, the head and the brain don't even move. It's too, this goes so fast that nothing even moves. It moves afterwards, after the wind hits and after the vehicle tips over, something like that. But the actual blast wave moves through so fast that nothing even moves. Is it progressive? Can you get MTBIs progressive and turning into TBIs? Um, yeah, great question. That's one of the ones that um, we've seen a few cases of multiple concussions that turned into really bad progressive degeneration. Um, it can happen. But we have no idea how common it is. It's, we do know that it's pretty common in athletes who have multiple concussions, boxers and football players that have multiple concussive injuries. That does appear to fairly commonly result in a progressive neurodegenerative syndrome. But we, we haven't done the studies. I mean, that's one of the things we're interested in doing is following these guys who've had multiple concussions. Luckily, one of the good things that the military does is after you've had a serious concussion, they get you the heck out of there. So unlike professional athletes who get the heck back in there after they've had serious concussions. So, um, so I think we're gonna, I'm not sure we're gonna see as many because we don't have the people that have had, I mean, I've never seen a soldier who's had 100 concussions the way I've, I've seen football players that have had 100 concussions, for example. Because it didn't matter what anybody said, they went back in there. The military, they just order them to leave, even if they don't want to leave. And, so, and this is an example of actually football concussions. So this is somebody, who, this is a, a player, a, a retired NFL player who committed suicide because his, his depression and headaches got so bad. And his brain at autopsy had some abnormalities on diffusion tensor imaging that we see. And it had this protein called tau, which is one of the hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease and, one of the, and the hallmark of this new disease called chronic traumatic encephalopathy. So this is this progressive spreading of tau protein that clogs up the neurons and interferes with their function and probably is the cause of that progressive neurological and psychiatric, there isn't really any difference, um, <coughs> set of symptoms. And um, so what we're, one of the things we're working on is a way to make this diagnosis while these players are still alive. Right now, there's no way to make the diagnosis while they're alive. We only make the diagnosis w after they die. That's a problem, because we'd very much like to uh, make the diagnosis while they're alive so we can help them. We can treat their symptoms, but there's nothing that we can do fundamentally for the disease process itself while they're still alive. <laughs> right. You can stop playing football and stop boxing, but the problem is these symptoms come on decades after they stop. I mean, you could, you're right, you could cancel the whole sport. The American, Neuro, American Academy of Neurology at one point called for a ban on boxing, a worldwide ban on boxing. That didn't go over, over very well. Nobody really cared what the neurologists thought. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, but yeah, that's, that would be one possibility. But that, that's about as likely to happen, in my opinion, as us stop having war, not having wars anymore, and not having blast injuries for war. It's just my opinion. You, I could be wrong. Other questions about injured acts? Yes, please. Topic, and I could probably spend a whole hour talking about different types of headaches. The bottom line is that there are many different types of headaches. Some of them are caused by damage to the nerves that run around the outside. Some of them are caused by damage to the bones. Some are caused by damage to the, uh, the meninges, the leathery covering around the outside of the brain. Some are caused by damage to the blood vessels in the brain itself. And some are caused by abnormal waves of electrical activity moving through the brain. That's called migraine. Migraine is an abnormal wave of electrical activity moving through the brain. 
And migraine is the one that's the most common after brain injury. So we think that although all of those are possible, the most common cause is damage to the brain that triggers those waves of abnormal electrical activity that move through the brain and cause the symptoms of migraine. And we know that migraine also has a very high genetic um, vulnerability. So some people, no matter how much you damage their brain, will never get migraines. And some people, even after a very mild, relatively mild injury, will get very severe migraines. And we're starting to uncover the genes that are responsible, which exact, which, which exact genes are responsible. There's a, a really amazing story. There is a, really, a, it's an, actually an awful story. There's uh, several families, primarily in Europe, that have a, extremely vulnerable to migraine headaches. And um, after a really minor injury to the brain, they get such severe waves of abnormal electrical activity running through the brain that their brains swell up and they sometimes die, even after a minor head injury. So some of the, quote, second impact syndrome, some of the really catastrophic events after minor head injuries are probably due to that phenomenon. We've made a mouse model, a transgenic mouse, that adds the gene responsible for that human condition into the mouse. And we can give the mouse a very mild head injury. And the mouse gets severe brain swelling and dies also. So it's very clearly due to that uh, genetic um, predisposition. So, and yeah, and yeah, and then there's the converse, where lots of people can get all the head injuries they want, and they will never get headaches. They have lots of other things wrong with them, but not headaches. So that's the music that damage. That's right. They can have damage. Well, they may know because their personalities change, their memory may be off, they may be depressed, but not have headaches. There's lots of other things they could have, but not, not necessarily headaches. Yeah. That makes sense? Please. Yeah. Uh, is the issue with these uh, patients uh, the, the fact that there's brain swelling is the issue, or is it the brain is bruised and affected its tissue that dies uh, that causes these problems, the epilepsy and so on down the line? Um, it's a great question, and the answer depends on how severe the injury is. In concussion, it's just injury to the axons, just torn axons. There's no bleeding, no swelling, no bruising, nothing except for, except for torn axons. As the injuries, with more severe injuries, yeah, you get all that other stuff. Epilepsy itself, usually seizures, usually requires a more severe injury. It usually requires some bleeding or, or structural damage to the cell bodies. Not the wires, but the actual cells. And so that usually requires a more, in, a higher degree of force that's greater than just a concussion, than, than, what, it, than what would cause a concussion. Concussion very, very rarely causes epilepsy. Well, usually it requires a more severe injury than that. And certain parts of the brain when injured are more likely to cause epilepsy than others. The hippocampus, which is in the back here, right next to the amygdala, um, is one of the parts that when injured is really very likely to cause epilepsy. And uh, But other parts, like the occipital lobe and back here, when injured almost never cause epilepsy. Empirical observation, why that is, we have no idea. Is there another? Yeah, please. Um, so the scans that they use now, were they actually used in uh, part of the Yes, and that's what I'm going to show you next. Okay. I'm pretty excited about that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, please. When people have these concussions, do um, like if you have a certain concussion, two people have the same or similar one, do people recover differently, or is everybody the same? Everybody's different, and that's what keeps me in business. If everybody was the same, I could just write a book and hand it off to everybody, and it would be easy. No, everybody's different. Well, first of all, we can never be exactly sure whether any two people had exactly the same injury or not, because the actual mechanics is always a little bit different. But I'll give you an, um, even injuries that seem to be essentially identical, or as close to identical as we can get, people recover very different. And we have some interesting data that we think it may have to do with genetics, in part. Um, but then there's a lot of things that we don't know why some people recover better than others. And uh, one of the things that we know, one of my titles was, and what we know that we don't know, and that's one of the things that we know that we don't know. But it, it keeps me in business, because 
people that aren't recovering the way they thought they should have are the people that come to see me. they have something that's very similar to the impact test. In fact, the military used a lot of the sports concussion uh, literature to design their own programs with the assumption that the concussions were going to be fundamentally similar. And one of the things I'm going to show you is that they're not. So they did the best they could, but they didn't exactly get it right. And one of the things I'm going to show, well, okay, I'll skip to one of the bottom lines, um, one of the punch lines. Sports concussion affects particular parts of the brain more commonly than others. Blast-related injuries in the military affect a different subset of brain regions most commonly. And one of the regions that's most commonly affected in blast-related brain injuries is this low front area called the orbital frontal lobe. Not commonly affected in sport injuries, but very commonly affected in blast injuries. And this is a part of the brain that controls emotional resiliency and mood stabilization. So those impact tests and the military equivalent test things like attention and concentration and memory and reaction time. But they don't test anything related to emotional stability or social intelligence. And that's where a lot of the deficits are in our military personnel, is in interpersonal skills and emotional resiliency and emotional stability. We know that these part, when if you have a tumor in that region, that's how it manifests. If you have a spike driven through that region, that's how it manifests. It's, it changes in personality, emotional impairments, um, change, uh, changes in stress resilience. <coughs> so, but they didn't know. They did the best they could. And so that's why it's an iterative process. The next generation of testing will include that sort of thing. So, can't take any single test too seriously, because it only tests what it tests. The other thing that blast injuries do is they affect the cerebellum, this part of the brain in the back, which is very sensitive, which is part of the part that's involved in balance. So an impact test that you may take or a cognitive test that you take where you're sitting quietly and taking a test on a computer doesn't test your balance at all. Now the military did figure that out. A balance test is a big part of what they do. Their return to duty criteria include stress loaded balance tests because of this damage to the cerebellum. So they, they did actually get that right. Please. So those are the areas for blast TBI. What are the brain areas most commonly seen for sports concussion? Um, in sports concussion, the areas that are most commonly seen are around the outside of the top, the sort of the superficial dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, the top super, very superficial areas of the cortex. Also, a big tract called the corpus callosum, which runs from right to left and left to right, connects the two halves of the brain. And also a part called the fornix, which uh, connects the, to the hippocampi, which, the hippocampi, which is uh, involved in memory function, a deep white matter structure that's involved in memory function. So um, that's the, uh, at least that's what we know of so far. But you know, the more we look, the more we find. So we'll see as we start. Is that because their helmets are deficient in certain areas, or if you beat up certain areas of the helmet, it might help? Um, it's a great question about whether better helmet design would be helpful. Um, I'm, not the, I'm not an expert on helmet design. I presented my data to the MIT group, which is an expert in helmets, and uh, they were really interested because the claim was that, yeah, maybe we could design a helmet that would protect these areas better. Um, but I don't know that personally, and the MIT group is amazingly um, not forthcoming with their data. They don't seem to want to publish it in the <coughs> where everybody else can read it. They seem to want to keep it for themselves. I'm sure they're cooking up something cool behind the scenes and they're going to make a lot of money out of it, but uh, they're not sharing it with the rest of us. But I'm going to show, let me show you one thing that I think argues that it's not completely a helmet issue. Um, Let's skip to this, skip through some of this stuff. Um, yeah. So when we did simulations of a blast injury, as simulations of a blast wave moving through the brain with no helmet at all, just a naked brain, 
Um, the result of the simulation was that certain parts of the brain are much, experience a much greater amount of shear stress than others. And the parts of the brain that experience the massive, the highest shear stresses are this orbital frontal region and the cerebellar posterior fossa region. So, I mean, it fits beautifully with our data. And this has nothing to do with helmets. But this is just a simulation. And I just told you that we're not anywhere close to being able to do an accurate simulation. So this is an inaccurate simulation. <laughs> it's a cool simulation. It used the same code that the Sandia National Labs guys have been using to test nuclear weapons for a long time. It, it you know, tests computer models of nuclear weapons. But the blast physics is very accurate. But the material properties of the brain are not very accurate. And so it, one could argue that this is a garbage in, garbage out simulation. On the other hand, you could argue that it made a prediction and our data validated, verified that prediction, so maybe there's something to it. But what it tells you is that these are the vulnerable regions, so if you want to design a helmet, it's got to protect those regions. Some of our guys were wearing helmets when they were injured, some of them were not. Um, I, we haven't really been able to analyze the role of, of exact role of whether they were wearing their helmets or not. We haven't. We just haven't been able to do that yet. And again, this is blast. This is blast simulation, not contact. Right. Movement. Right. That's true. The simulation was just blast. However, in the real world, IRL, as my teenage daughter likes to say, in real life, um, the, um, the the injuries are always complex. There's a blast. And then the person gets thrown across the room and bumped into, crashes into something, or a building collapses on top of them, or the vehicle that they're in rolls over and they, they may strike their head. So they may, the rule, not the exception, the rule is that there's multiple types of injury, multiple events that occur with any injury. And so sorting that out is quite hard. We have actually been able to track down uh, four individuals who had pure blast. We screened about 10,000 people and we were able to find four that had just pure blast. And um, they had injuries to the cerebellum, the posterior area, but not the orbital frontal. So maybe the, maybe the simulations were only partially right. So we obviously need to do a lot more of this. This is why I'm, this is why I'm telling you this is, a, this is a work in progress. This is just a, I'm, I'm, I'm showing you some pieces, but I'm not showing you a whole, a whole puzzle, a whole picture. If you're confused, you're right to be confused. It's not just giving pieces. Please. Um, you mentioned you know, not taking any particular instrument too seriously. And I've read like, a little bit about like, partner manual dangers, but it seems to really speak about respect and as though it's sort of a whole different level. I was wondering if you're familiar with any of the ones that have been talking about. Um, I'm going to stand by my statement, which is don't take any single imaging method too seriously. You're on really solid ground as a scientist when multiple lines of evidence can, are concordant. And any particular test, any particular type of experimental evidence you propose is always going to have strengths and weaknesses. That's just the scientific method. That's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. Nothing's perfect. But when you're on really solid ground is when you have very different types of data coming from many different directions, they're all giving you the same answer. That's when you know you're really honest. And so, yeah, that's the goal. At least that's my view of scientific value. Please. Um, many people around the world do animal studies, and um, in, a, in, in this particular audience, I'm not really going to comfortable commenting about animal studies. <coughs> no offense, but just not a good idea. <laughs> it's been extremely controversial over the years, and I recognize there's strong feelings on both sides of this argument. Uh, 
So lots of people do mouse experiments. Mice are extraordinarily useful because we can put human genes into mice and replicate genetic factors that may explain some of the differences between people um, in mice and test mechanistically, test the mechanisms underlying those specific genetic effects in mice quite easily, whereas not in not too many other easy ways to do that at the moment. So yeah, I mean mice are incredibly valuable and not all that controversial and a lot of people use mice. What gets what starts to get more controversial is when you start to use an animal whose brain is more similar to the structure of a human. So mouse brain is very different from the structure of humans, so the injury affects the mouse brain very differently. Um, you start to use pigs or monkeys, that starts to get very controversial. There was a laboratory at the University of Pennsylvania that in the 1970s that was using uh, monkeys, doing monkey experiments, and um, the people for the ethical treatment of animals uh, uh, had a narc inside of, of the lab. They hired so, a young woman who was, went to work for them as a technician, and she uh, worked for them for a year and uh, took video and exposed the whole thing, and the entire lab was shut down. The guy was fired, he lost his job. Um, the monkeys were all, um, some of the monkeys were actually killed in the raid on the lab by accident, not that they intended to. Um, it, was, it was really a disaster. It was really a dark chapter in the, uh, in the history of, uh, of, uh, of uh, scientific research. And, and in fact, the monkeys were not being treated appropriately, so it really was not a, it was a dark chapter on all sides of, the, of that story. So, um, yeah, it's a little complicated. I'd be happy to talk with you afterwards. So, just a few examples of what blasts can do. Flipped over this giant, this giant truck, this thing weighs uh, about 20 tons. This is what happened to it after one of these blast injuries. The people in here survived, by the way. There's an example of how big the blast was. There's the truck, for example. It's a big blast. Here's one of these trucks. Okay. 14 tons, sorry. Um, so after these folks are injured, they got on a plane like this, and they land in Rammstein Air Base in Germany, and they have a flying intensive care unit. So we have everything you would have in an intensive care unit inside that airplane. And they arrive at Launchstuhl Hospital in Germany. Question. Yes. Oh, yeah. So the Air Force has done a lot of work on that, and um, they find that it does in the long term. But they have not been able to show, I mean, it doesn't look like it for a short period of time. It doesn't look like it, like a short airplane flight, like an eight-hour flight. It doesn't look like it has a devastating effect. It may have a subtle effect. And so every time they have a casualty, they have to make a triage decision can we take care of this person in country and not have to fly them out? Or do we have to fly them out with, of course, the risk that they may destabilize and get low oxygen pressure and things like that during the flight? And um, oftentimes they do fly them out because the specialty care that's available in Longstuhl, Germany is so much better than the care that's available in Afghanistan. Are these in air chambers or something of that nature for those Um there has been some movement to put hyperbaric uh, chambers in the, um, the airplanes. But for now, what they're doing is just administering 100% oxygen. So normal baric, one atmosphere, 100% oxygen. Has there been any uh, searching or looking into uh, Yeah, so the Department of Defense has funded a very large study of hyperbaric oxygen treatment. So, you know, two, two and a half atmospheres, twice, you know, two, twice, two and a half times the normal density of, uh, of air, oxygen. And so far the results have been really disappointing. The final results are not in, so I could be, I could be, I'm still, I still have a little hope. Um, but so far the results have been disappointing. At least the results have been presented in public. Um, so when my patients ask me about hyperbaric oxygen therapy, I am. I can't be too enthusiastic. It sounds great, but I can't. The empirical data so far. Is there a difference between uh, even after the injury of 
pressure or is this approach going to be immediate afterwards and then long term care? All the studies ongoing have been longer term. None of them have been ultra acute. The logistics of applying hyperbaric oxygen to um, uh, very acute injuries hasn't been sorted out yet. Just, yeah, just they haven't figured out a good way to do it. If you have any good ideas, let me know. Because you need to maintain access to the patient in full monitoring, so that if something that we know is bad happens, we can intervene. Or that's not a totally trivial thing to do in a hyperbaric chamber. These are great questions. So in 2008-2009, we enrolled a group of US military personnel in our study at Launchstuhl, Germany. And we, by the way, we were the first civilian research group ever to do uh, this sort of project in a military hospital like Launchstuhl, in this military hospital in Launchstuhl. Um, just personal connection that I made with Colonel Flaherty and our mutual dislike for the, one of the Army psychiatrists bonded us together. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, they're young, they're all young men, almost all Caucasian, almost all army, almost all enlisted men, and injured in a mixture of Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, I've already talked about the definition of concussion, traumatic brain injury. This is this method, diffusion tensor imaging. I might as well spend a minute on this, because this is cool, actually. This is a, a cool little bit of science that you guys will enjoy. Um, the axons in the white matter are in any small area of space, generally running the same direction. All the wires are going in a bundle. They're all going in the route about the same direction. With the MRI scanner, we can measure the diffusion of water in many different directions. Diffusion is this random movement. Just If you put a drop of ink into a uh, glass of water, the ink would spread out. That's diffusion. But if you put a drop of ink into celery, it would not spread out the same in all directions. It would spread up the celery, up and down the fibers of the celery, much more than it would spread through the celery, right? Because the celery has these fibers, it's aligned. Um, the brain white matter, the brain axons are like celery. They have a fiber orientation. So by measuring the diffusion of water, we can measure this thing called the diffusion tensor, the CTI, which is how fast the water is diffusing in the long way up and down the axons versus perpendicular in the opposite directions. And this normal, healthy white matter has high anisotropy. New word, anisotropy. Not the same in all directions. Isotropic means same in all directions. Anisotropic means not the same in all directions. This has high anisotropy. But after injury, the anisotropy would be reduced because the barriers to diffusion perpendicular and like loss of membrane integrity and junk in the axon clogging it up so that it cannot diffuse properly up and down this way, both of those things would reduce the anisotropy. And so the expectation in theory is that after, after a brain injury, the axons would have greatly reduced anisotropy. And that's what this new scan method, diffusion tensor imaging, is showing. Normal, high anisotropy versus injured, low anisotropy. Isn't that cool? When I first heard about that, I said, wow, that's really awesome. What a great idea. Um, so we thought it was such a great idea that we've spent the last, um, what, 10 years now working on this. Here's some examples of how it looks in real life. Now I'm changing up on you. Instead of just how high the anisotropy is by how bright it is, I'm also showing it in color. Green means it's running front to back in the brain. And bright means it's high anisotropy, not quite so bright means it's lower anisotropy. This is an injured subject. The anisotropy is lower than it is in the uninjured control subject. But here's a conventional MRI, the kind that you could get at your doctor's office. It doesn't show anything. It's completely normal. The diffusion tensor imaging shows the abnormality, but the conventional MRI completely misses it. So if your doctor tells you you have a normal MRI scan, that doesn't mean much, does it? It just means the MRI scan missed it. Um, and we've seen in real life, right, because we look at these brains under the microscope, there actually really is injured access there. Here's another part of the brain. This is the middle cerebellar cuticle in the back here, one of these parts that we know is vulnerable to injury. Same thing. Here's nice, normal, high anisotropy. Here's low anisotropy in the injured subject. Look, it's really low, actually. It's almost gone. And again, the conventional MRI scan just completely misses it. Here's a third region, the orbital frontal white matter. This is this front part right here that is involved in emotional regulation and mood stabilization. Um, it's low. It's really low. 
in this subject. And the conventional MRI scan just completely misses it. So we thought this was great. Look at this, we're actually seeing it. We looked at a lot of other regions though, a lot of other parts of the brain, and a lot of scans. And most of the time, even this method, even this cool diffusion tensor imaging, still misses it. We're still not good enough. There's an awful lot of normal values here. These are all, each one of these, each one of these symbols represents one of our injured military personnel, and each of these is a control. Controls are US military personnel who are evacuated from Longitool for other types of injuries, not brain injuries. So they're otherwise very similar. There's a lot of overlap and a lot of spread in the distribution. There's a, there are still some people who have abnormalities, but there's an awful lot of overlap. And these are the regions that you asked. The question was, what parts of the brain are commonly injured in sports concussions? These are parts of the brain that are very commonly injured in sports concussions. There's a few abnormalities, but, but mostly normal. Again, here's these blast simulations pointing to those two regions that I talked about, orbital frontal and middle cerebellar peduncle. And here's those regions now aggregated. I can, it's easy to show a few examples, but what does all the data look like? Well, here's all the data. There are definitely more people than you'd expect by chance who have abnormally low anisotropy, indicating injured axons. But there's an awful lot of them that are normal. It's statistically significant, but in terms of clinical useful, usefulness, if this is my patient right here, it doesn't help, right? Because that particular person is wrong. So we are not all the way across the finish line. I'm mixing my metaphors now. I know I'm talking about um, war-related injuries, but we're not across the finish line all the way yet. This is better than the previous generation of, of me imaging methods, but it's not as good as it needs to be. In summary, looking at our 63 soldiers, uh, military personnel who were enrolled 18 of the 63 were definitely abnormal with this new method, whereas zero out of 63 were abnormal using the conventional method. So it's better, but all 63 had concussions. All 63 had traumatic brain injury. And this did not distinguish the ones who were doing well versus the ones who were not doing well. Most of them were not doing well. So we have not solved this problem yet. But this is an, you know, science is an iterative process. We each generation tries to do better than the generation before. Definitely did better than the generation before, but not good enough. These injuries, these abnormalities evolve, they do not resolve. We scanned all these people again six to 12 months later, and we could see that the injuries were evolving. The scans were changing over time, but they were not going back to normal. Um, and it was just as bad at six to 12 months. There were just as many abnormalities, well, 12 out of 47, in the initial scans, 11 out of 47 on the follow-up scans. We didn't get to see everybody back in follow-up, but of the 47 we did, so, just, so it's fair. Um, it was about equally sensitive um, at follow-up as, uh, as it was initially. Um, and I'm gonna skip that. And just to sum up some of our data, um, this method, diffusion tensor imaging, revealed abnormalities consistent with traumatic axonal injury in many U.S. military personnel with blast-related TBI. None had detectable injuries on CT or conventional MRI. 18 out of 63 had significantly more abnormalities than expected by chance, and the distribution of the affected brain injury suggested a mixture of primary blast effects and other mechanisms. So remember I said that the primary blast effects suggested cerebellum and orbitofrontal but there was also a smattering of other regions as well, so there was probably a mixture of effects. Um, but a lot of the subjects did not have DTI abnormalities, and it's still a clinical diagnosis. Even regardless of what the scan shows, if the doctor says you've had a traumatic brain injury, you've had a traumatic brain injury, and, and you should be treated for it, regardless of whether the scan is negative. So um, I'm going to pause for questions here, and then I'm going to get into the relationship. Well, this is a, well, let me, let me, let me get on to this. This is actually really interesting. Um, the hypothetical model for what's going on is that everybody has a baseline, and a lot of people, every single one of these events is very stressful. These are war related injuries. A lot of people's buddies got killed in these same events that, that were injured, and where they got injured. And everybody has an acute stress response. And some people have some recovery from that stress response, and some people degenerate and deteriorate into symptoms like post traumatic stress disorder. We know that injury to the amygdala as we talked about, prevents this process. You cannot develop PTSD if you have injury to your amygdala because you just don't have the circuitry to develop that sort of fear learning. But what we think, the, hypo the hypothesis is that injury to these medial frontal circuits 
is responsible for part of the recovery. And part of the reason that the data that is associated with traumatic brain injury with post-traumatic stress is because damage to the parts of the brain that are the circuitry involved in recovery from stress is damaged. So if the circuitry involved in recovery is damaged, of course you're not going to recover as well. Of course you're going to have more severe post-traumatic stress-like symptoms. This is a model. We're testing this model. We haven't proven it, but it's a very plausible model based on what we know about the structure of the brain and the nature of these injuries. So, we haven't solved the problem that's been raised since World War I about the nature of shell shock. Organic versus psychogenic, brain injury versus psychological reaction. But this is a model that's biologically plausible and testable using modern imaging methods. Okay, now I'll stop. Questions, please. How do you fix that with drugs? How do you fix it? Um, Drugs are partially effective. Cognitive behavioral therapy is partially effective. And we hope that by understanding the structure of the brain, we will be able to design new targeted therapies that will be more effective. I'll give you an example. My hero is a neurologist named Helen Mayberg, who works at Emory University in Atlanta. And she studied the structure of the brain in patients who had strokes and became depressed after their strokes, very badly depressed after their strokes. And she found that certain parts of the brain, when damaged by the stroke, lead to a very high risk of depression. And so she worked out the circuitry for exactly which part of the brain, parts of the brain were affected by these strokes that led to depression. And she designed, along with her neurosurgical collaborators, a deep brain stimulator, so an electrode that could be inserted into the brain in just the right spot and stimulate that part of the brain in just the right way to relieve the abnormalities in the circuit that were contributing to depression. And it works. It's beautiful. People who did not respond to antidepressants or electroshock therapy or psycho uh, psychological counseling or anything described it as like turning up the colors in the room when they turned on the, the stimulator because the depression was just lifted as the stimulator was placed. So that sort of idea, the idea that by understanding the circuitry of the brain, we can alleviate something as profound as depression, major depression, is getting back to the philosophical point of where is the line between psychiatry and neurology? Well, it's blurring very quickly, isn't it? And it's not because the psychiatrists are taking over, it's because the neurologists are taking over. Uh, I'm the neurologist. <laughs> um, so the hope is that by understanding this very simplistic model, this medial frontal circuitry, we would be able to intervene in a targeted electrical fashion. So there are some right now who are sticking deep brain stimulating electrodes into the amygdala to try to inactivate it. It's not been a home run yet. Another mixed metaphor, sorry. Um, it has not yet been a home run because we don't understand the circuitry well enough. Helen Mayberg spent about 20 years working on the circuitry of stroke-related depression. So, but that's the hope. That's the goal. That make sense? Yeah. And there's another part of the puzzle that may help us design better therapies. And this is genetic resilience. This is one of my coolest findings, and this is why, don't, don't, don't take this home, because this is unpublished data. This, is not, this needs to be repeated and validated before you all should believe it. But it's, um, it's pretty exciting. Everybody in red has had a blast-related brain injury, and everybody in black is a control that has other kinds of injuries. Same amount of combat exposure, same amount, both serve, all served in war, same amount of stress, but just has not had a brain injury. What we're seeing on this y-axis is how severe their post-traumatic stress symptoms are. The people with brain injury are much more severe. Now, whether that's due to medial frontal circuit damage or not, that's the testable hypothesis. But this is the interesting group right here. These people are born with the genetic variability, with the genetic variance in an interesting gene called FKBP5, FKBP5, that makes them resistant to post-traumatic stress. 
They had the same sort of brain injuries. Nothing different about the brain injuries that we can tell between these groups. But their level of post-traumatic stress symptoms was no different from the controls. If you just looked at the controls, the people that had not had brain injury, this gene didn't matter. There's no difference between these groups if they did not have a brain injury. But in the setting of brain injury, they had less post-traumatic stress symptoms. Something about them, this gene may, possibly, make them resilient to the effects of brain injury. So it's a classic gene by environment interaction. The gene does not matter until the environmental stimulus is present. And we have lots of examples of that. So for example, we have lots of genes that respond to bacterial infections. The gene doesn't matter unless you actually have that particular bacterial infection. We've got some people have genes that make them resistant to HIV. That doesn't matter unless you get HIV, unless you get exposed to HIV, but there are some people who are genetically resistant to HIV. Um, this is an example of a genetic resilience factor to post-traumatic stress after a brain injury. We think. We need to repeat this and do this over and over again. But getting back at the question of therapy, this is a protein that can be targeted with drugs. We already target this protein for immunosuppression. Some of our immunosuppression after organ transplants targets this protein. We never thought about targeting this protein for post-traumatic stress disorder, but now that we see this, we're going to think about it. We're going to think very hard about targeting this for post-traumatic stress disorder. But we would have never thought of that without this kind of data. And we're going to make mice that have the two versions of the, the post-traumatic, of the, uh, of the, the FKBP5 gene and see if those mice how to behave the same way. We'll be able to test new therapeutics on the mice much faster than we can test them in, in people. Please. I'm curious about the age of an athlete. If you compare a 13-year-old that's injured on an athletic field versus somebody who's 25 years old, does the younger person fare better if the injuries were, if injuries were comp uh, comparable? That's a big if. Right now, there's no way to tell whether the injuries are comparable. So that question of whether 13-year-olds do better than 24-year-olds, has there's evidence on both sides. There's evidence that 13-year-olds do better, and there's evidence that 13-year-olds do worse. And it's all based on how do you compare the severity of the injuries. There's no way to accurately compare the severity of the injuries. So I think that entire line of investigation is fundamentally flawed. Important question. Because at what age do people should people start doing things that makes them high risk of concussion? If there are certain ages that make them extremely vulnerable, uh, then probably not such a good idea. But we can't answer that. We know that we don't know. You guys tired? <laughs> it's eight twenty-three. We haven't even talked about sports. People die and we look at their brains after recovery, they have some scar. The brain makes a specific type of scar with a specific type of cell called an astrocyte. And yeah, we can see a scar in the brain. It's very different than a skin scar. It's made of a completely different type of tissue. The brain has a completely unique way of forming a scar. And we also see inflammation, chronic inflammation white blood cells of the brain, they're not blood cells, but they're similar to white blood cells in the brain, um, persist for years, decades even. So there may be some chronic ongoing inflammation in the brain. So a really hot topic, a quick question is, is that inflammation, is it doing harm? Is it doing good? Or is it just there, not really doing anything at all, um, for good or, or, or ill? And um, that's a big question, right? Because you'd love to be able to, to treat that. But yeah, under the microscope, you can see a scar in the brain. Yeah, please. You mentioned that when the axons are injured, there's an abnormal protein that accumulates. Does that accumulate acutely, or does it take a long time to accumulate? It accumulates very quickly. It accumulates within um, four to five, four to six hours in humans. It accumulates within about an hour in mice. Um, so if somebody dies immediately, and it hasn't had any time to accumulate, 
No, you don't see it. But if they live for at least a few hours after their injury and then die, you can see the you can see the protein accumulating quite well. So forensic pathologists use this to determine how long a patient lived after after the injury, for example, like when the injury occurred relative to death. You can detect it in spinal fluid, but it doesn't help. Yeah, you can, but it doesn't predict the severity of the injury or the timing of the injury. The spinal fluid is kind of like looking through the garbage. There's a lot of garbage that gets in there, and you can learn something about what's going on in the house by looking at the garbage, but there's a lot of things that happen in the house that never show up in the garbage. If you had, Randy, if you had Dr. Bateman, one of my best friends and colleagues up here, he would tell you a very different story, but I'm, I'm kind of, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of garbage in spinal fluid. Yeah, please. Is there a way of preventing this protein uh, forming? Is it a protein that's already just in the body and it's just drawn to the site? Or is it the body starts to produce that protein? Um, the body's always producing the protein, and it's always being transported normally from the cell body where it's made all the way out through the axon out to the synapse so it can talk to other nerve cells. And when the axon gets injured, that transport gets interrupted. So you can think of it like a railroad train, where it's on the train, it's a cargo on the train, and if there's a damage to the railway line, all the cars will accumulate and all the cargo will spill out. It's not that the cargo is necessarily causing harm, but it's a marker that there's been a train crash or a damage to the railroad line because there's all this cargo accumulating at the site. It's almost exactly like that. In fact, there really are little tracks in the axons that are used for transport and little engines that, protein engines that transport these cargos along the way. But you said that, the, that this buildup does impair the function of the whole cell. Ah, two different, ah, okay, so now I, now I understand. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't understand your question exactly. There's two different proteins we're talking about. One of them is amyloid precursor protein, that's like a cargo that shows the marker of the, where the tracks are. The tau protein, the one that actually does harm to the cells, that accumulates slowly. There's a little bit that accumulates right away in the first few hours, but it accumulates slowly over decades. And it has this funny property, tau does, that a little bit of tau leaks out of the cell and triggers aggregation and accumulation of more tau. It's sort of like a, it's a spreading, it's almost like an infection. Where, one, where some tau triggers the accumulation of more tau, triggers the aggregation of more tau, and it spreads slowly through the brain. Is tau used for anything else by the brain? Oh yeah, it's, a rich, it's actually a really important protein. It's used for stabilizing the railroad tracks, stabilizing the microtubules that are used for transport. So yeah, it would be nice if we could get rid of it, but it's actually a really important protein. When it's a, you know, good protein's gone bad. Yeah, I'll, I think you're in place. Sorry, thank you. T A U, like the Greek letter. Yeah, sure. So, just a question here about the amount of protein. Is it possible to use an isotope to label it to see if it's going to be rarer than the protein? Oh, like in spinal fluid. In the air, sorry. So, it's a, it's a good idea, and it has, um, in general, if you have a protein target of interest, you could find a, a chemical that binds to it and label that chemical with a radioactive isotope, and then you'd be able to see it on a scanner, like a PET scanner, which is really good at detecting radiation coming from the brain. So there's lots of examples of other chemicals that have been targeted that way, but so far, amyloid precursor protein, we've not been successful at doing so. It's possible, but we just haven't accomplished it yet. It's a technical problem. Just haven't found the right compound to do it. Um, just trying to think if there's anything that I know that's recent about that. I don't. It's not a particularly great target. Uh, there's other proteins that are better targets, and that's not it's not a particularly great target. Yeah, please. The concentration of power that's on the damage cell that builds up over a long period of time, is that 
Yeah, yeah, no, that's a really cool idea. That's a really cool idea. Um, yeah, in the brains of these, for example, injured football player who's had 100 concussions and has had this terrible degeneration, that player could have a thousand times more tau than would be present normally in the brain. So just massive amounts of tau. Um, and yeah, there's lots of examples of chemicals that target the abnormal aggregation of tau. And those are in various stages of testing for Alzheimer's disease and frontal temporal dementia and chronic traumatic encephalopathy, because those are all proteins that involve abnormal accumulations of tau. Um, so far, they haven't been overwhelmingly successful. A lot of them are not very good at getting into the brain. They work great in cells in a dish, but they are having trouble getting them into the brain in high enough quantities because there's just so much tau. You would you would have to you, you need to get rid of a lot of tau. Is it that the mass that's right. They don't penetrate, a lot of them don't penetrate the blood brain barrier very well. So one of my good friends at Washington University, who I hope maybe will come and speak at something like this someday, is a guy named Tim Miller. And he's got the idea to target the brain's production of tau by genetically knocking down the genes that are producing the tau in the first place. So they're not knocking it out, but they're just knocking it down. So again, just as you say, you'll still have some tau, but you just won't have the massive amounts of tau. And right now, that has to be done by implanting a pump in the person's spinal cord, which is a neurosurgical procedure. Um, and so it has to be pretty serious to be worth implanting, doing a neurosurgical procedure to implant that pump. And so then pushing it back a level, you have to know that it has a pretty good chance of working. So you have to know that there's actually a lot of tau in that person's brain. So you have to have a way of detecting the tau while the person's alive. And that's what I'm thinking. It's, detect it's a way to detect the tau while the person's alive. But you see the cascade of logic. <coughs> okay. Um, it's 8.30. I could talk all night, obviously. You okay. guys probably ask questions all night. Okay. <laughs> um, is there any, I, let's see, I'm just trying to think if there's anything else. Oh, here's an example of the tau, just so you see it. You've heard me talk about it. There it is. This is early stage. You see just a little of it here, a little bit of tau at the beginning. This is what we hope. Eventually, we hope that we'll be able to detect it when it's at this stage. Because when it's at this stage, it's too late. Because this person, half their brain is already destroyed. Even if we got rid of the tau, it wouldn't do any good because half the brain is already been destroyed. So we need to be able to detect it at this stage when there's just little spots of tau. So our detection method has to be very sensitive. This is a progressive. This, by this stage, where it's really almost completely destroyed the hippocampus, this person has almost no short-term memory anymore because the hippocampus has been destroyed. So we clearly we want to get to it before it gets to that stage. It's too late at this point. This is the stage we want to get to. Um, Take home messages, I've already told you all these things. Open questions, we've covered a lot of these. And this is the most important slide that I want to show. <laughs> these are my daughters. All right. I'm happy to stay and answer questions as long as you guys want. But I'm going to sit down and you guys can come up and talk to me for a bit. Because I know I'm going to be all right.